Hi there, my name is James McLaughlin. I'm the editor of CDN, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the next session, Designing Mobility. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I'm just going to give you a quick reminder to uh, visit our expert areas and see our sponsors and uh, perhaps arrange a virtual meeting. They're all there and waiting you, for you with um, with uh, very interesting uh, technology and, and, and design tools. Um, now, Traditional, traditional definitions of a car becoming increasingly blurred as new methods of transportation continue to emerge. From ride-sharing schemes to electric scooters and automated vehicles, a new generation of designers are taking on the challenges posed by rapid urban, urban development and the environment, and the question of mobility outside of the city. Our expert panel today is going to explore the intersection between design and mobility, exploring the big questions around infrastructure, the role of public-private transit transit systems, automation, and how to design for this new world. And I'm delighted to welcome them. That they are Paul Priestman, Professor Dale Harrow, and Dr. Chris Thorpe. Hi, guys. Morning. 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 Nice to see you. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to ask you first of all just to introduce yourselves and tell, tell us a little about a bit about what your uh, expertise is. Um, probably starting with you, Dr. Chris, if that's okay. Thank you, James, and uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Chris Thorpe. I'm the acting head of program for the Royal College of Arts New Intelligent Mobility Program. Um, I come from an innovation background and headed up the innovation team at Kinetic for 11 years. I've got a passion for design, high quality design thinking, um, and I work very closely with Dell, who is head, heads up the Intelligent Mobility Design Centre. So thank you, James, and uh, welcome. No problem. Uh, next up, Professor Dale Harrow. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone and uh, welcome to this event. And my name is Professor Dale Harrow. I'm a head and chair of the IM Design Centre at the Royal College of Art. It's a spin out that we started really from the traditional vehicle design programme at the Royal College, which had been very successful in training hundreds of uh, vehicle designers over the years and really changed in terms of starting a, a, a programme, an MA programme, but also attached to it a research centre and design centre staffed by a multidisciplinary team looking at the issues around future and, and mobility and things like systems design and ethics and other issues to do with this new age. My own background is in as a designer and a product designer and vehicle designer and I've done many projects including the London Taxi. London Taxi, um, certainly an idea of a, a paradigm of mass transit, uh, which leads me on to our final speaker, Paul, you may not be uh, familiar with Paul, but he's uh, he's not doesn't come from a traditional car design background, but he is. Uh, well, I'll let him speak for himself, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, James. Thank you. Um, well, it sounds like a bit of a Royal College um, sort of uh, <laughs> get together, but I studied at the Royal College many years ago as a product designer, and um, I, I think the work that, that that I've been involved in and Priest Magood is, is best known for its work in in uh, the design of high speed trains in in China. Uh, spaceships um, and, of course, um, aircraft interiors and aircraft. So, you know, some of our big clients are people like Airbus, um, NASA, um, and um, some of the the new transportation companies. And I think one of one of the takes of, of, from my interest um, is is mass transit um, and uh, what are we going to do about congestion in cities um, and how are we going to solve some of the, the, the massive pollution issues of, of people traveling around the planet because we're not going to stop traveling. And there is this really interesting paradigm of, of public and, and private transportation. And, and there's that overlap. And what we can see, certainly in the last year or so, um, how we are being asked more and more to look at how people can travel in different forms, whether they're flying in electric personalized vehicles or traveling around the streets in, in electric vehicles. But um, it's incredible how, how things have changed. And also the fact that um, these these projects are coming from different sources. It's not from the traditional big companies with sort of years of, of development programs ahead of them. They're wanting to see something now and like immediately um, in a very, very different atmosphere, which is incredibly exciting. It, it is exciting, and I suppose the, the, the speed of the ideas is matching the, the speed of change, or well, we hope it is. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't realise, actually, just on a side note, I didn't realise one of your clients was NASA, Paul. <laughs> that was, that's, uh, that's quite, uh, the clients don't come much bigger than that um, intergalactic uh, flight. Um, but actually, on the subject of, um, of solutions, I think it would be a nice starting point, actually, for you to talk about some of your work you were doing 
for the city of Cambridge um, and yeah. and uh, with Dromos Technologies because um, it's a live project, it's a live, it's a live, it's a working example, yeah. and and it would be nice to sort of get started with that. I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Dromos technology is is a really interesting technology and, and one that I I think is is solving some of the the, the mass transit, private transit um, sort of conundrum. And uh, we won the contract uh, a year or so ago um, to design these vehicles and also all of the items that, that, that will sort of appear on the streets as these systems emerge. And yeah. um, I just we, want you talking actually, Paul, I just say could I, to guys, could we get a, do you think we could get an image up while Paul, Paul's explaining it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, the, the, the main thinking behind this system um, is, is that it is uh, a system which uh, allows point to point transportation, but it's mass transit. And one of the unique um, thinking behind this concept is, is that it's, it's only a metre wide, this vehicle, allows for two, two plus people to travel, which is the most common sort of volume and number of people travelling. And we designed this vehicle actually around the, the internal space, as many people are looking at this now, but put, particularly in public transport, of course, that's, that's how we start projects. It's all to do with about the public experience and the, and the passenger experience. And... Um, you know, we, we cover lots of different things, and this is a, a scheme which is being um, proposed to Cambridge at the moment. Um, and we're competing against some of the more traditional sort of heavy rail alternatives. But there are autonomous vehicles that, that go to a point, pick you up, and then join a dedicated um, travel way, a lightweight, and then can travel at high speed close together and then, then peel off and deliver you to your particular destination. And I think one of the other areas of this is that, of, of course, the, one of the, the, the big congestion issues in cities is, is, is um, the delivery area. And these vehicles can be used for that purpose so that they can uh, take a person to, to do local delivery in a particular zone using this infrastructure um, and then do their delivery and then get back onto the system again so that we're not having, uh, you know, the, the myriad of, of deliveries and vans clogging up the cities. Yeah, I mean, I know from my own experiences, uh, it, every time I look out the window, it seems there's a backlog of traffic behind a, a Cardo truck or something like that. Um, what's, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the start point for the design of it, because, um, you know, it, I, I believe, you know, you've spoken in the past about how you need to design from the inside out. And I think this is probably quite a good example. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it is it is a, a very um, a tight uh, sort of package and platform that we're designing around um, uh, the, the steering mechanism and the, the drive unit, but also then building up around the maximum space to allow accessibility. Um, and this this sort of format of, of seats facing each other is, is not unique. And a lot of people are looking at this because obviously you don't need a driver, you don't need a big engine sitting in somewhere. Um, and, and, and the starting point, I mean, if you look at, at some of the work we've been doing for, for the new car for London as well, you know, the, the actual living, the, the sort of the usable space in a, in a, in a classic uh, taxi car or a car for car sharing um, is, is for, the, for the actual passenger, the purpose of it being on the street is so small compared to the footprint. Mm. Um, so how can you actually maximize um, the the sort of the volume of these vehicles in, in 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 the streets without taking up all of the superfluous space. I mean, everyone's seen those amazing images of a of a bus at a traffic light and a car at traffic lights, and how much space a bus takes up compared to a car, and it's a massive amount, of course. Um, so, how can we sort of rectify that slightly? And, and these there are lots of companies looking at this, but Dromus has really sort of advanced in this area, and 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 they seem to have a very good system for this. Mm. Uh, I, I would say, I mean, you, you feel free to jump in, guys. But from my own, my own you know, point of view, it's kind of it, the, 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 the footprint of the thing is what's quite interesting. You know, it's not much wider than the kind if you had a bike with some panniers on the side, it's not much wider, you know, wider than that. And I suppose it calls into the question this idea of real estate in the city and how much we're having to adapt this to this new world and often what is you know, in the case of London and certainly a lot of European cities, um, a medieval street pattern or, or certainly something that's not, not anywhere near as kind of up to date as, as, um, as the problems we're facing. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, th I think it's also the, the, the fact that, that um, you know, we're having to adapt. We can't just rebuild um, cities 
um, every time there's a new sort of form of transport. We have to make what we've built work better. It's getting the grit out of the system, isn't it? And, and um, how can we make you know, what we've got uh, perform to the current functions and, and requirements. And, you know, as, as we as we look forward to through, you know, hopefully past the moments that we're going through at the moment into, you know, post-COVID, um, you know, will will there be pressures on on, on rush hour as much? Um, and what's, what's the rush? You know, and I think that's a really interesting whole sort of subject matter is that if you're able to work as you go to the cafe or at home and as you're traveling, then then why do you have to go at high speed? Why not take the slow road and enjoy the moment? Because you're you're still carrying on your daily daily activities as you travel, which takes the pressure off. And I think it's these different ways of looking at a situation and a problem sometimes throw up a, a new and better solutions. Absolutely. I mean, it's really well said, Paul. I think the other thing that's interesting is there's a convergence of technologies that's really convergence of technology and circumstance, really, that's bringing these things together in a really rapid way. So... We're seeing a lot of interesting companies that are new to the market that aren't hampered as well by the, the processes and technologies and techniques that are in, in conventional automotive companies. So they're able to produce and react to things much quicker and get there. And certainly from our students, I think they're seeing these new companies as very attractive places to be to be working in and to be involved with rather than the traditional you know, seven months or 15 months to create something. They can be really at the forefront and really inputting in into that. And I think that's a really strong thing. I think Paul also raised a very interesting thing about adapting to kind of cities because going back to what we were talking about earlier, the, the idea that solutions for Paris are different from solutions for London. The architecture of the vehicle might be the same, but the way those vehicles are used and the culture, the culture around vehicles and transportation is incredibly important. I'm of the view that mobility is really essential for kind of modern life and it doesn't have to be the same mobility we've done. But I think the COVID situation has really shown people how important mobility is to, to social co cohesion and also access to things like um, healthcare and other, other things. You know, we yeah, can't yeah. just be remote, you know, and distanced anymore. I think what, what I also really like about your... Um project there, Paul, the Dromos system is how you've you've taken very much a user-centered approach and it's it's almost leading to completely new formats of vehicle which have a much higher sort of profile. It's changing the stance of the vehicle, all these traditional things that we've seen in, in vehicles. And I think Dale and I were talking um, offline before about how we're kind of coming from a car paradigm, but actually we need to completely reinvent the paradigm with autonomy and with the, the vehicle package now because the layout is completely different. There's much more freedom in a sense. Mm. Uh, there's much more also, there's much more opportunity to actually really think about the, in, the use of resource in an intelligent way, both in terms of space, how much um, fuel these things need, how much power, um, how these things can be repurposed maybe for, for, for passengers, but also maybe for taking goods, as I think your, your solution provides. I think we've got a great opportunity as designers to, to actually challenge a lot of the things that we've, we've inherited from car culture, I think, and that's what I, I really like about some of these new directions that we're seeing yeah. and it's fantastic actually yeah i mean i, 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 I do so think that, that in, on on that on that subject you know the the, the i always think that the, the car sharing hasn't really taken off and i think that one of the reasons it hasn't taken off is that the vehicles are not designed to be shared and uh, james mm -hmm. when in our last conversation i mentioned you know you you, you get into a, a a normal car which was designed for personal ownership and you're asked to share with someone on the back seat and it's like it's a bit like sitting on someone's sofa together yeah. you know it's yeah. like it's, it's like it's not designed to share you know and, i have a very and, bad experience of picking up a shared car and the previous person has obviously put aftershave on and then driven the car you know for the whole day i smelled, smelled of the great smell of brutes you know it was a terrible <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing where you can't just you can't just take an existing product and put it into yeah. a different context and you expect it to work, you know. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of subtlety with this stuff, you know, and kind of hygiene and things like this are really crucial yeah, to these sort of solutions. I think I think also that I think a lot of the sort of if you like the design intelligence of how to do that comes from other other areas like the service sector and yeah. you know the, the kind of interior design space. So. I think those are so so important now, and, and it's so important that we don't forget that those are kind of almost critical to getting adoption in, in sort of these new formats of vehicle, to really think about how can we 
how can we divide space in such a way that it makes it comfortable for strangers yeah. to to use it how can we make it how can what level of intimacy should there be should it be you know um how, how do we sort of mix public and private um, space occupancy these sorts of questions these are, are really important questions for designers to answer i think mm. and i think i think from, from my from my point of view is, is that you know that's exactly what what we do on in aircraft design all the time yes, yes, you know how do, yes. we're designing private space in a public space Yes. And how do you design, if you're an economy class, to give you privacy when you're going to mm. sit in that seat for 8 to 12 <laughs> hours with That's inches for the next person? And, and it's exactly that. Or, you know, obviously, if you go up the classes, business and first, they're getting more and more grand and you've got suites and things. But, you know, even in the back of a, of a normal four-door car, to privacy, angling the seats away slightly, a little bit of a privacy screen, um, perhaps respringing it so you don't bounce when the next person sits next to you. Um, <laughs> you know, all of those sort of sympathy, and it's cleanable. You know, yes. it's, you can hose it down. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the sort of requirement. Paul, I've got to ask you actually, just before we, um, it, uh, with the with the competition for for Cambridge, were, were there any uh, traditional car makers in it, or was it seen as a purely a job for outside of the automotive sector? Um, that, that's, I mean, it, it was a it, uh, it was a, a bid that was, that, that, that's that's gone in, and and it was um, the requirement was was probably um, thinking about traditional light rail um, options, right, right. Um, right. So railed options, and and Dromus is obviously not a railed option. Um, and and when you when you're comparing the sort of the the impact on a city, if you look at you know the, the disruption in in for instance in in um, Edinburgh when they introduced the trams there um, yes. was was years yes. of, of disruption to the city. Absolutely, turn um, that city upside down, and, haven't and, they? Really? And, yeah, exactly, and and I think one of the issues that that governments and cities have is is the, the fast moving technology. You know, a year ago, who would have thought that that cities would be able to be closing streets and allowing more cycle in? You know, when when previously that was seen as almost a marginal activity, and everyone was saying that's never going to happen, not in a hundred years. And look, it's just happened in a year, and then the electric scooter suddenly pops up. You know, <laughs> if you're if you're running a city, how do you manage for that when? Building infrastructure can take twenty years. I mean, look at look at some of the big rail developments like Crossrail, or, or you know, uh, how can you how can you predict what is going to be needed in the future? And this this certainly this last year has thrown up many many questions about whether you need to do those big infrastructures. You need to sort of reevaluate what we've got and make that more fit for purpose. Yeah, that's a very good point, I think, Paul, because, I mean, we part of our lab has got a, a section in which we call People and Place, which is looking at city infrastructure and how it's changing and policy decisions, and also how you engage the public more in those places. And I think one of the things we've found that working with architect practice and otherwise, how do you plan for a city when, say, architectural practices don't have the expertise to know what's coming down the pipeline in, front, in sort of new mobility? So you, you can see it now, you can go to any any um, major building in London, look, go to the car park and there's no charging points, for example. Yeah. There's no 5G access. So how are we going to get to a point where we can get, you know, autonomous cars getting into those spaces, being able to drive in those spaces and being able to be charged up? And these are buildings that are built, being built now. They're not buildings that are built 50 years ago or 30 years ago. So it's really important that when we're planning, when cities are being planned, it's being planned in a, in a holistic way with the transportation as part of that scenario from day one, you know? I suppose this speaks to a, a, an idea of we don't, we're not quite sure what the solution is going to be quite yet. So it's very difficult to kind of predict. I, I agree, Dave, with the architecture we're seeing at the moment, or the cities we're seeing at the moment, it's very much geared, it very much feels like a 20th century solution. We, and, and we're not, um, we haven't necessarily moved it on. I mean, the, the, we got a whole new breadth of architecture in the 60s when the car was king. Um, but that's no longer the case. Or we're trying to move away from that. But you know, how 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 do you sort of you know? I suppose how do you how do you design with something? Not you're not quite sure what the destination is in terms of the solution. Paul's project demonstrates it very well. In a sense, what you have to do is kind of find those little gaps in the in the in the, the gaps that make a big difference. You know, often it's a very small thing that can really change a whole concept or a whole scheme. So, like Paul is saying, something that's the width of a uh, you know, a bike with corners or a you know, a conventional bike lane. How do you get vehicles in those situations that you wouldn't normally get to? So I think there are opportunities, and uh, I think there's a problem with uh, legislation not catching up fast enough. And we're seeing that with electric scooters, where we're not seeing that 
you know, the adoption for that because it's still hampered by legislation, the insurance rules and things like that. So cities have got to become more more flexible, I think. And what we're in a kind of period of test, testing these things. And what I hope is the innovation doesn't get snuffed out by policy coming in and just closing down things, you know? Mm, mm, mm. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, quite, yeah, yeah. Um, I, mean, I think what's it's quite instructive, um, is Dale and Chris, the, the way the um, you renamed the course actually at the R, the RCA, and it was it was specifically moving away from you know automotive to this idea of mobility. But I wondered how that had shifted the the the, the thinking, or the or in fact the, demo, the 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 type of student you were attracting. Yeah, well, that's a very interesting point. I mean, I I took the course through this name change at the time. It was because, I, I mean, I, I was at a period in, in my own career where I was the dean of the design school, which enabled me to work much more multidisciplinary. Now, I'd run also a big research project looking at an autonomous, implication of autonomous in the city as a design exercise, looking at all, all, whether it's pedestrians or users. And I think I think the conclusion for me was that the design, we need to change quite significantly the way we were teaching. And Chris came on board. And we're, we're really in the idea of looking at the journey experience and trying to create people that can work in this new, very mobile, well, mobile world, you know. Mm -hmm. So the sorts of things we're doing are much more training people about empathic user methods, other ways of understanding research. And Chris will explain a bit further what goes on day to day. Yeah, I think that, I mean, the biggest shift, and we present this in, in sort of the images that we talk to students about who are coming on the course, is the biggest paradigm shift is moving from the vehicle as an, as an object, if you like, or an artifact that's self-contained to mobility as a system. So how, you know, a, a mobility mix connects into urban environments. And, you know, there's still a lot of students who come on the course and want to develop and design vehicles, but increasingly we're seeing students who are wanting to do public transport, who are wanting to explore, you know, drone technology, flying, marine-based truck. And I think that's completely appropriate given both the new types of opportunities for technology and these new you know they, you know uh, systems like um rechargeable power and so on and so forth um but also with the congestion in cities so we're seeing a you know this there's a big debate going on about mega cities and smart cities um we feel that the design needs to be brought front and center to that debate to make sure things that are developed are culturally relevant they're sustainable um, they can be things that people can enjoy and want to use. And so designers are, are really kind of the unique element to catalyze appropriate solutions and, and create vision in a sense in, in the way that Paul has showed again with his fantastic Dromos uh, system. I think that's a great example of bringing together technology and design, um, but looking at critical questions. And so the course uh, and the students on the course are really aligned to trying to ask those big questions and trying to come up with vision uh, in a way to deliver uh, completely new solutions in this in this mobility mix that we would call it now, I think. Yeah, and I think I mean I think designers need to dream, you know, and the difference is now yeah. really designers can dream and make their dreams a reality in a different way to what they did in the past. So I don't think you wouldn't come to our studio now and see people drawing rocket ships to inspire their car design. You know, you're seeing people that are finding real problems and finding solutions to them. That's bringing in a different sort of student <coughs> gender mix, for example, much more international. Those things are all great, you know, much more inclusive. People thinking much more inclusively about transportation and, and, and again, much more entrepreneurial, I think, with, with people wanting to graduate and start companies and do things like that. So I, I think it's a really refreshing thing that's happening, not a, not a detrimental thing. And I think, to be honest with you, the, I mean, being completely frank, the car industry needs to get its act together to encourage these bright brains into it, you know, because okay. if it doesn't, it's going to lose its way, you know. Um, I've been I've been saying this to people for quite a time, you know. If bright designers do not see the car industry necessarily as an attractive place to be anymore, you know, it, they, they, it's it's too big business. It's uh, too slow for them, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the other... The other major thing in the program that is something we're trying to encourage and develop increasingly is getting the students to really buy into research as a process of you know research through design you know and, and to not see research as something that happens and then you get on and do some sketches but to really you know buy into trying to really understand and unpack some of these problems they're social anthrop anthropological yeah material technological and the the best most successful designers on the course are kind of 
they're comfortable in those spaces where they're the, the sort of the complex questions that they're, they're sort of challenging into related uh, issues and they can sort of piece them together in, and, and reformat those in ways that make sense and so research we see research as a really important part of the project and we see it as a very creative way uh, into getting our students to really um, as Dale said to dream but to dream in ways that make sense in a way and the, and the, and the way that, that we've structured it with a, a design and research center so that's the center of staffed with designers uh, architects researchers uh, entrepreneurs in that in that space with business working together so it's a very rich environment for a student coming to the college and a very unique educational experience I think you know mm. I, I think what's interesting as well is this the, you mentioned this an entrepreneurial spirit and the, but what I what I'm quite interested in is this idea of this public private sort of yeah. cooperative to deliver some of these schemes and I'm Paul maybe we could speak a little bit about that yeah. because it's, it's an interesting confluence of different forces you know creativity local government uh, innovative um, uh, technology companies yeah. and maybe maybe you could unpack a little bit of that for us yeah, I mean, uh, following on from from um, from Dale as well, I think I think the, the design of the of of these vehicles um, it, on a street is 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 absolutely critical because um, they have such an impact on 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 the environment. Um, if you see a you know a hundred of these same vehicles, what are they? You know, what does that do to the city? Um, if anything, I'd say it's more important than 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 designing a single car because you you've got them. I mean, the great thing about designing in public transport, as we do in, in designing a high speed train for for uh, you know for, for China or wherever, is that it becomes an iconistic image. It becomes mm. almost an example. It's it's a an image of that city. You think mm. of you know any 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 country, and you probably re remember the 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 the, the, the high speed train that is in that city or, or country. Mm. So it is a very impactful, and I do think that transport is becoming more of a, and it will become more and more. And cities are recognizing that that transport is one of the reasons that people go to that city. Mm. You go to a city because you want to travel on that tram, or you want mm. to go on that boat, or you go to Venice to go on the Vaporetto, or whatever. Um, and I think that's that's a, a fantastic opportunity for designers, and and the, the the this mixture of public private, and I think cities are beginning to realize that this is a very important part of of the of the whole city, of the whole sort of well-being of the city. Well, and, I think um, a sense of place is absolutely critical. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that that's really interesting. I mean, you, you know, take for example London. You could uh, you could say take, take someone, blindfold them, fly them all around yeah. the world, drop yeah, them yeah, somewhere. Yeah. They would land and open their eyes and London. Oh, I'm in London. If they saw a bus or kind of yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that 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 speaks to some of the work you, uh, Dale and, and, and Christopher, have been doing at. Um, uh, about you know the students producing stuff that is kind of that has a kind of cultural um, contextuality to it. Um, maybe absolutely. Yeah. Dale, I don't mind who, who, who picks that up, but well, it, it, just it pick is. up what Paul's saying. I mean, for me, I think um, I think the the taxi in any city kind of is the handshake of the city almost. Yeah. And a London taxi is very particular, but in Japan, when you go to New Japan and the door is opened, and it's a you know, there's kind of interesting kind of social and cultural references when you see a taxi and it kind of for me it sums up the city almost you can see in japan that kind of courtesy with the way the, the taxi operates in london you can see that sense of service and almost the kind of social strata you know and so there's kind of interesting things going on. um and i think you know the interesting thing about this boundary between public and private is you know if you do get car companies moving into that space in the middle let's call it civic let's call it civic transport where you've mm -hmm. got traditional manufacturers moving to create models of delivery where they're not selling a product, they're selling a service, then it gets really interesting in terms of the opportunities, I think, from both ends. You know, that meeting in the middle of the traditional public and private boundaries and how they mesh together with maybe traditional manufacturers, rail industry, you know, new on, new companies coming in, it's really exciting, that kind of bubble there. I mean, exactly. I, I, I think just on the on that, um, that confluence, I just going back slightly to the... Um, this idea of civic being civic minded, I suppose, and Paul, it, just something you mentioned earlier about your uh, car for London, yeah. um, it, it has an element of, of um, well, maybe you could make a, you could tell us a little bit about it, the, the fact that it could perform service as well as as well as deliver. Yeah. People, I mean, the, the 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 thinking behind that is that the 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 the, the new car for London is, or, or it could be a new car for New York or new new car for for Milan, of course, um, and and it's it's basically it, it's it's knowing that these vehicles are out there traveling. Um, and 
within these vehicles, there are safety and, and medical equipment on board so that mm. if there is some kind of event or, 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 or need, then these vehicles can group together and travel to that event. Um, so the, the, the vehicles definitely have this, this civic sort of, um, this, this, this uh, involvement with, with the city as a whole rather than it being a private operator. Um, and if you, if you look at some of the, the, the private cab operators, you know, they are very private, they're very individual, and they're really not contributing to the city. Mm -hmm. And I think in the way that public transport does, um, and if you think of, you know, the, the, the great sort of the, the, the London Underground roundel, the graphic, is the, the warm sort of a pair of hands that, that allow that, that, you're, that you're looked after and you can travel anywhere in the city. Um, and, and I think that can, that, that, that can go over into more private public transport, then that's all to the better. Um, we're getting a few yeah. actually, Paul. While I'm saying, while you while you're talking, this sort of feeds into some of the questions we're we're being asked um, on the chat because people people seem very very interested in what you guys have to say. But um, one of them cuts to the heart of it: How do we bring about a change in mindset? We've had a hundred years of kind of personal vehicle ownership. I mean, mm. it, it, it is it does seem to be quite a challenge to sort of flip it around. But I don't I don't know how we how we begin and design does design have a role to play in that. Yeah, I think I think it definitely does. But I mean, I think I think in in that conversation, you you need to talk about are you are you talking about urban city or are you talking about um, in out of city because they're two very different subjects. I mean, in my studio in central London, no one has a car. Um, my young designers don't even have driving licenses, and and I don't think they're thinking of of buying a car. Uh, why would they? Um, so I mean, th I think it's changing. It's it's absolutely changing. Um, and, and I think that's how the, the car manufacturers are reacting, and they should be reacting to that that shared ownership or, or where. I mean, there are lots of people looking at this. Um, the, 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 the other the other areas, of course, if if you leave uh, uh, the urban environment, and then you, you talk to someone living in the Midwest of America and saying, that, you know, cars are going to disappear, and they laugh. You yeah. Know? Um, so I, I think there is. You know, there are different reasons for that. I was doing a radio interview recently, and, and the first question is public transport. You know, I live in a village. There are no buses. How, you know, how does that work? You know, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that is classical. But there are some really good advantages, uh, uh, innovations there of, of public transport on demand and shared, you know, groups. And, and, and there is this thought, I, and one that I'm particularly interested in, does public transport become the community? You know, it's a bit like going back to, to, to living in a community and you, you, you're going down the shops and you offer to get something for your neighbor. Um, you know, does this, does the, this, this sort of shared uh, public transport on demand allow you to get together and all go to, to another place together um, exactly as you want? And I think that's, that's very interesting rather than these big um, forms of transport moving down a fixed route, sometimes over full and sometimes completely empty. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's on demand. And I think that's that's a really interesting development. Oh, Someone else actually just specific, speaking to specifically to your project, Paul, about this idea of um, it, well intimacy, I suppose, and mm. and the necessary the necessary nature of these things to be space efficient and with the Dromos project. And but it is, I mean, you are being asked to sit very very close to someone in in that space. And I I, yeah. I wondered how how them um, how would that go over? You know, people. Might the, the, the the idea that the, the thinking behind it from the Dromos point of view is that the the most common um, travel number is one or two people mm. so the idea is that if you're traveling by yourself you you take this vehicle yourself um so that that's how that that works and the fact that the that it joins a system and joins together it's in effect you're in your own compartments within a system um, and that's how you get the mass transit so um it does allow that social distancing um, but it, it's really going for the, the the typical mass, most common number of travel, you know, frequency of, of of how many people travel together. That's how that's right. solved. Um, but I I would love to keep talking, to be honest. I mean, but there's so much more to discuss in in terms of you know autonomous vehicles and urban urban versus uh, rural and and so much to to talk about. Maybe we need a part two. And we, we'll, we'll do it all again. But I'm going to have to leave it there, guys, I'm afraid. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Professor Dale Harrow, Dr. Christopher Thorpe, and, of course, Paul Priestman of Priestman Good. Um, I'll see you in the next session. It's me again doing um, materials where technology meets materials. So uh, stay tuned. But thanks very much, guys. Thanks. Thank you, thanks, James. James. Thanks, 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 thanks Paul. Cheers. Bye, bye.